All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome this afternoon to the International Coalition of the Performing Arts Aerosol Study, round two, preliminary results. Uh, a couple of things here before we begin is, remember these results are preliminary. Uh, we're releasing these because of the time sensitivity of getting back into the schools, the classrooms, performance venues of our uh, music, speech, debate, theater, uh, dance, and other performing arts activities. We want to uh, make sure that you understand as we progress through this data set that this is all preliminary information. We'll be having more information come out as the study continues to progress with our final, um, final results coming out in late November, early December. The purpose of this today is to go on what we have discovered more in the last few weeks. So we will not have a complete set of information for you today uh, that will solve everyone's questions uh, that you may have out there in the world. We do understand that schools are turning back on and that people need answers as quickly as possible. The information we have here today is believed to be as complete as we can provide it to you scientifically based uh, for a Thursday afternoon in August. With that said, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, the team that is working on this. We have uh, myself, Dr. James Weaver, the NFHS Director of Performing Arts and Sports. I want to introduce my co-chair, Dr. Mark Speed, who is the CBDNA President and Director of Bands at Clemson University. Uh, this has been a pleasure for us to chair, even though uh, I don't think either of us have slept a lot in the last few weeks, but um, we have enjoyed this process in trying to find uh, ways to return to our performing arts activity in a safe as safe of a way as we can, as we can find. We want to thank our lead funders today. Uh, the NAM Foundation uh, is a special shout out. They are our lead funder and have provided a matching grant uh, of 45, 40% of all funding that was needed. Uh, with that, this project would not be available without the members of NAM and their generous contributions to the research that we are looking at doing here for our performing arts entities. I'd also like to thank the NFHS uh, Foundation, the Dario Foundation and the CBDNA uh, membership for their um, their generous contributions um, to fulfill about 70% of all of our funding. Uh, we have an amazing community of performing arts networks out there that have given um, their support financially and otherwise. All the logos you see on the next two slides are of the people and organizations that have supplied uh, financial support to close the rest of the gap. When we talk about the gap on this, this is not a inexpensive research project. This is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range. Uh, and the reason why is because we have, as you will see from our uh, panelists here today, some amazing scientists doing amazing work and um, you can't do amazing work for nothing. And these guys are doing great work and uh, we are excited for all the support from all the, all the organizations that have given their uh, financial support to make this project happen. Mark? And a special shout out to the College Band community, uh, which I'm the president for the College Band Directors National Association. So you can see the, um, the collegiate conferences also contributed as well as some individual universities. So special shout out to my uh, colleagues in the, in the college and university realm. And uh, these uh, organizations fill out our unprecedented coalition. Uh, this is probably the first time in the history of uh, the world that this many music organizations have come together for a common goal, which is to find uh, solutions to the problems facing all of us uh, in the world right now due to the pandemic and especially in the performing arts arena so that we can quickly get back uh, to what we love and do best. Uh, I want to introduce our uh, two lead researchers, uh, Dr. Shelley Miller from the University of Colorado Boulder and Dr. Juliana Schubring from the University of Maryland. Uh, these two are brilliant scientists and really do a great job of uh, breaking down some intense scientific information for Mark and I to understand and be able to share with everybody. Uh, and they are working around the clock with their teams. Uh, you'll see here on the screen uh, their teams here on the left. You'll see the University of Colorado Boulder team, uh, Professor Jean Hertzberg. Uh, I'm going to mess up all these names. Uh, Abhishek Kumar, uh, Dr. Samir Patel, Taya Stockman, Professor Darren Tuhi, and Professor Marina Vance. And on our University of Maryland team, we have uh, Nicholas Batiste, Sebastian Romo, uh, Lingzi Wang, and um, Sh Dr. Shengwei Zhu. So we're very excited for all of them to be working on this project. 
So uh, why are we doing this study? Um, it was uh, determined back in April that um, the amount of scientific study on the production of aerosol and performing arts activity was really lacking. There was not a lot of information to help us uh, with the current COVID crisis. So uh, in order to get students back to what, what, uh, what they should be doing in the, in the performing arts, uh, we, we are looking at ways to mitigate the production of aerosol. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about aerosol in just a moment. Uh, and and we, we all strongly believe that the performing arts are integral, uh, integral to uh, education and society in general. You know, a, a world without performing arts is not really a, a, a whole world. And uh, our quote from Dr. Shelley Miller, uh, talking about aerosols. Aerosol generating activities have the potential to transmit COVID-19 as the research shows, but we have very little data on what kinds of generation happen when playing instruments and singing and acting and other activities. We will be studying this phenomena in our aerosol laboratory at the University of Colorado Boulder. And with this data, we'll be able to provide better evidence-based guidance. And I should say the duplicate study is uh, ongoing as well at the University of Maryland. So a couple of disclaimers we have, uh, because we all know how this works. Um, we have to make sure that we're covering all of our bases this year. So the preliminary results are from our first few weeks of exploratory testing. They'll be further defined as the study continues, and we're providing these preliminary results to assist in a safer return to classrooms. This is something that is not normal in our scientific communities. They typically want to have everything peer reviewed and all that done prior to releasing anything. Um, so they, we are very gracious to their kindness of letting us have, um, to their comfortability level, the results that we currently have. Uh, the study focuses strictly on distribution of respiratory aerosols that are released while playing wind and brass instruments, singing, acting, speaking, dancing, and uh, eventually with a simulated aerobic activity. Uh, we are not using a live virus. We are not infecting participants, and we are not allowing participants to be infected while doing laboratory experiments. So something that we can't answer is, you know, if they play, will they be infected? We can't tell you that. Uh, what we're doing is identifying performing arts activities that generate respiratory aerosols, including volume, direction, density, estimate the emission rates of respiratory aerosols, model the dispersion of these aerosols, and investigate mitigation strategies that contain aerosol distributions from our performing arts activities. So we're gonna watch a quick video here from Dr. Shelley Miller. She presented at the Texas Band Masters Association, uh, I think a week or two ago. Page. I'm an aerosol scientist and I'm actively studying aerosols my whole career. Uh, but we love this slide that came from the EPA and I, I got it from my colleague Lindsay Marr, where we want to understand the size of the particle because the size of the particle in an aerosol, which is simply a particle, a particle suspended in a gas, and because I'm an air pollution engineer, much of the air pollution is particles suspended in gas. Uh, we look at the first, the, the, the diameter of a human hair is about 70 microns, and we can all see that size. Uh, when we go to find beach sand, we can still see it. It's about 90 microns. We go to something called PM10, that's 10 microns. And now we're getting into the size where you actually can't see. And this is a pollutant that EPA regulates. And then to a fine particle is PM 2.5. And again, this is the size of PM 2.5. And here is the size between 10 and about 200 nanometers where we think the virus um, is exi existing in particles. And here are the different diameters of all of the airborne virus that we are concerned with in our current um, health uh, system. Airborne viruses are naked. They're surrounded by respiratory fluid, which makes them um, a little bit larger than just the naked virus. And the size of the particle determines the lifetime in the atmosphere. In indoor environments, we estimate that a 50 micron particle can stay suspended for quite a while. And so anything smaller than that can stay suspended for quite a, quite a long time and where it deposits in the respiratory system is also dependent on its size. <clears throat> we know very large particles get lodged up in the nose and the throat and smaller particles go into the deep lung where then they can cause uh, deep, deep lung issues like pneumonia. 
This diagram came from my colleague, Dr. Yugo Lee, and, and it's a really nice diagram that we appreciate about how airborne transmission occurs. An infected person will be talking or coughing or in this case, singing or playing music and a cloud of aerosol, will, cloud of particles or an aerosol will be released. If you're very close, closer than social distancing norms, you can inhale some of the larger particles and you're right in the cloud of a very high concentration of aerosol. And if you move farther away, then you have removed yourself from the high concentration zone and now you're in a, a, a zone where it's a little bit lower concentration and you could still inhale an airborne particle that could have a virus, but your risk is much lower. Um, the fomite route is thought to also cause COVID-19. Um, we don't know if this is as dominant as the aerosol route, but this is why we encourage everyone to wash their hands. So I apologize for the audio there. I'm not sure what was going on. We'll make sure when we repost this that it'll, um, the audio will be fine uh, when we repost this. So basically what uh, Dr. Miller is showing, you see from all the graphics there is how small these particles are, how they transmit through the air and that touch is still a transmittable component. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on with the audio, but we'll fix that. So I'll have making those comments. We'll make sure we got those in there. Um, so what we're going to look at now is our APS uh, information, which is the aerodynamic particle uh, size or spectrometer. Uh, it's based on the acceleration of the airborne particles that are measured into an airflow through a nozzle. And so we're measuring 0.5 to 20 micron particles in this, in this component. So what we have here is the, um, the oboe APS. And what we're looking at is basically the setup areas. And then we measure with the inlet of the, um, the instrument at the very beginning here near the keys when they play a scale. And then when we move the instrument to the bell, we see where the scale uh, comes into play here. And it's a very big peak at the end of the bell. And then this is the exercise that they're playing. So it says play near bell. That means we're beyond the scales and the worms so are playing the actual exercise. Uh, then we used a bell cover with the uh, instrument for oboe, and you can see a dramatic decline here in the amount of aerosols that are being expelled past the, the end of the instrument. And then we did the same thing here where we played near the, we had the exercise played again near the keys, and you'll see that playing near the keys for the exercise and playing near the keys for the scale are about the same. The big thing we're looking at with the trajectory of what we're trying to accomplish here is what mitigation factor actually works in our directionality, and we're looking at open play versus, versus a bell cover. You'll see a dramatic reduction there. Uh, next, we're looking at trombone data here, and you'll see um, this is our scale near the bell. And then what we look at here is the scale uh, uncovered as we play, um, we play near the bell. And then the bell with a bell cover with a one layer stretch nylon for breathability. Now, what we did was we saw a lot of people after our first uh, go around, they were stretching their bell covers to fit over the ends of the bell. As you stretch a material, the thickness of that material degrades quite, or loosens up quite a bit. And so it allows more particles to go through. So what we found here is with the stretched nylon over the bell, it really didn't have an impact because we're stretching it so far that it's not able to catch those aerosol particles being emitted out of the end of the bell. So then what we look at, which is an important thing for us to understand, uh, then we look at our background data, what we measure near the mouth uh, from the buzzing of the embouchure, and then we get into um, near mouth with the mask. And so we're really looking at all the particles coming out of the bell as far as the trombone is concerned. Mark? Okay, so this is our tuba and euphonium data. And um, you can see when the tuba begins playing, uh, there's really not a lot uh, a whole lot released out, out of the um, bell of the tuba. The euphonium, on the other hand, does produce uh, significantly more than the tuba, and that's probably due to the nature of the uh, smaller conical shape of the bell and uh, a, a slightly more, less distance travel than more direct path. So the, uh, the euphonium does have uh, more aerosol coming out the bell than the tuba. Um, and let's see, we did not, I, I don't think we were able to mitigate with a bell cover when this particular test was done, but we will obviously uh, go back and look at that with bell covers. And I, I you know, can predict pretty confidently that with the bell cover, uh, we'll see a similar reduction in particles as we do for the other instruments.
Thank you, Mark. Uh, the next thing we're looking at is uh, theatrical performances. Uh, when we look at the theatrical performance, we're looking at a stage monologue uh, volume here. And so uh, think about how you project uh, vocally on stage and what that looks like. And so we are really seeing a increase in our uh, concentrations of particles per uh, cubic centimeter. And when you see we put the, the mask on for the monologue, we see a dramatic reduction again of how many aerosols are being distributed into that, uh, that inlet. And our concentrations of uh, particles per cubic centimeter reduces quite a bit. You'll see here we have two different performance masks on here. Uh, one is just a, a, a mask, and then we looked at a better quality mask uh, in the surgical variety there. So materials do matter. And so as you are looking at masking, just to make sure that we're looking at the, having ones that have a, a higher level of efficacy throughout the, uh, and that, that should be labeled in the box, like kind of what it's rated at. Uh, next here, we're looking at a different, uh, from our first go around, looking at different testing and singing. So see here, we have scales or warmups, and then we sang a hymn with a HEPA filter on, and then just a hymn with no HEPA filter and no masking. And what you see here is between these two spikes, is we do see that with HEPA filtration, we do see a reduction of about half uh, in the amount of particles being uh, collected. And then we see too that there's not a big difference between a hymn and a pop song style in singing. So the style, we we're seeing not really a big difference, uh, which is good for us to know. The big difference happens when we sing with a well-fitted mask, what happens to that particle concentration level. And so that's really important. So like we're hearing all over the place, masking is really important. And we wanna really make sure we have that, uh, that through on this message. Mark? Okay, and here's sort of a composite of uh, the instruments and um, vocalists that we've uh, had in the, in the lab so far. So the, you know, if we go from left to right, the flute uh, really wasn't producing as many aerosols as we suspected. Um, and the oboe was producing quite a bit of aerosol. We want to go back and retest the oboe and look at a few things. The oboe player had a difficulty with playing with the mask on, so we did not get any data uh, wearing a mask, but the bell cover for the oboe did reduce the amount of aerosol quite significantly. Um, the clarinet uh, we had done previously, uh, saxophone pretty low, trumpet, um, the, uh, the, the, the bell covers are very effective, and uh, as you can see moving down the line, the vocal portion of uh, the theater and the singer the masks made quite a significant difference in the amount of aerosol being released. So that, uh, that is really important uh, moving forward that we all realize how important mask wearing is for anything uh, involved around the mouth, especially uh, if it's not going directly into the, to an instrument. Okay, and again, if you've got questions, uh, please toss them into the Q&A section. Uh, we're going to try another video here, and hopefully this one works on the flow visualization. Uh, for some reason, I'm not sure why I'm getting this uh, issue, but we're going to try this again. And if it is garbled, uh, we will fix it on a, on a repost to the YouTube channel. Okay, so that one's not going to work. So what we're going to do here is... Gene, are you good if I put you on the spot? And I'm just going to kind of forward frame by frame, and you can tell us what we're seeing. You can just let it play. I can just narrate over it. Okay, so I'm going to mute this, and away we go. Okay. Uh, so this is our motivation. I think that uh, everyone here is familiar with that now. Um, the idea of the flow visualization is primarily to help uh, determine the best locations and the best methods for making the quantitative uh, concentration measurements of the aerosols. Uh, we're also making some hot wire anemometry that's basically measuring the speed of the flow coming out of various parts of the various instruments. And then uh, Professor uh, uh, Cerebric will be able to use that in the simulations. Um, here we're referring to uh, some prior work that was done in, uh, by the uh, university in uh, Weimar. They have a beautiful Schlieren system that I'm envious of. Um, 
so they have some really great uh, Schlieren visualizations there. Hmm, seems to be stuck. There we go. Okay, uh, this is a, a little schematic showing how our Schlieren uh, system is working. It's a single mirror system. We are using a, a little LED light source uh, placed uh, two focal lengths from our mirror. Uh, the instruments uh, are close to the mirror, so we see both the, uh, the instrument in the foreground and also its reflection. And then we're using a, a, a knife to uh, cut off the disturbed images, sort of. Okay. Uh, laser sheet imaging. You'll be seeing uh, two different views. We take a little uh, laser, we spread it into a sheet. In uh, one view, the uh, yeah. instrument is pointing at the sheet, and, it's pointing, and in the other, it's pointing along the sheet. So in this case, we're seeing a trumpet. The two tabs are on the bell, and here uh, um, a trumpet uh, pointing at the sheet. So this uh, um, can't read it, but this is just some data. What our estimates of the velocities and the size of the jets are, and then this information will be later used in our simulation. One of the big takeaways from this is that the jets are very, uh, very dimensional and round. It's not just coming straight out of the instrument, and so this affects the way that we do our sampling in the future. Hello, everyone. I'm Abhishek Kumar, and I'll be talking about the visualization of flows from musical instruments. Due to the pandemic, a lot of musicians are concerned about the aerosol emissions from singing and playing brass and woodwind instruments. So as part of a larger aerosol measurement project, we're doing flow visualization to help us see the areas of significant airflow and optimize sampling locations. Using techniques like Schlieren and laser sheet imaging, we can estimate the velocity, size, and mixing characteristics of the jets of air. And with hot wire anemometry, we can get quantitative velocity data. Researchers from Bauhaus University in Germany released this video that demonstrates the use of Schlieren technique to view flows out of musical instruments. A link to the video is attached in this slide. We are using a similar technique. We have a spherical mirror and we have a source of light and a camera. And we are able to see the deflections because of minute changes in the refractive index. We used our Schlieren setup to look at flows from instruments and singers with and without coverings, such as 80 denier pantyhose as a bell cover. Here is a video of Thais Talkman reciting the alphabet from A through F. A, B, C, D, E, F. We are using two orientations for our laser sheet imaging. In the first orientation, the bell of the instrument is pointed directly at the camera. This gives us a sense of the diameter of the jet. The second orientation allows us to see the extent of the jet and gives us a sense of velocity. Now let's take a look at some jets made visible thanks to our laser sheet. Some preliminary velocity data is available at this point in time. For example, the trumpet generates a jet of about 0.4 meters per second when the low B flat note is played. The jet diameter for the trumpet when the low B flat is played is about 10 centimeters. To conclude, generally speaking, woodwind instruments can expel jets when specific low and high notes are played. Using a belt cover slows down the jets in the direction of flow, and we can see this with our Schlieren setup. The laser sheet data suggests that the jets are complex, unsteady, and highly three-dimensional. And our anemometry data agrees with our laser sheet analyses. Great, thank you, Gene. Um, 
we do have a couple more videos here that we were going to show. And what I'm going to do, since we're having some issues with the video being shown, I'm just going to kind of go on a frame here real quick and just kind of show some of the things we, we see. Um, you see here, this is the trumpet from behind the sheet. And you see this gigantic cloud being made from the, the trumpet. And so I'm just going to kind of fast forward a couple of frames here. And then this is the same trumpeter playing, but in front of the sheet. And we can see here how some of the, um, how we see some of those uh, explorations of the aerosol coming out. And the three-dimensionality gene, if you want to speak to that, that's really important that this is not just a, a flat sheet going through. Like there's a three-dimensional three cloud coming through here. The, the laser sheet is very thin but the jet coming out of the trumpet is quite, uh, quite thick. And we're not able to see the whole extent of it in a single 3D, uh, a single uh, uh, planar slice from the laser. So I also wanna mention that in the trumpet visualizations, there was a little bit of a breeze from a, a cooling fan on the laser that was moving the plume back, um, back towards the, uh, the player. And so, it, the, the extent is not necessarily representative of what would have happened if the breeze had been going the other way. Um, okay, that's uh, the takeaway from the trumpet. And then here we, um, let's see, this is more trumpet. Yep. This is the same, uh, the same, same one, one again. So this here's is the cross section of what's coming out of the trumpet and you can see how complex it is. So now this is a, a sheet a visualization of the oboe. Again, this is the view of the oboe pointing at the laser sheet and at the camera. Um, you can see it's uh, smaller in diameter. You know, the oboe bell is not as uh, wide. Um, but again, it's a very three-dimensional jet. It mixes quickly, but there still remain areas of high concentration to worry about. Uh, in our, in this case, the the high concentration areas are the black areas, and then the the, the gray area is the um, stage fog that's filling the room. And this is the one with the, without the bell cover. And so, Gene, if I can stay yes. here, this is all the plume coming out from the end of the oboe. Yes, and the um, because we're putting a human in the laser sheet, they're all wrapped up in black velvet which is uh, the blobby stuff there on the, on the left. Sure. And then here is uh, the same exercise here, but here is what we have with the, uh, the single layer aided near bell cover. Right. So we see and a in this case, there's no external breeze. And so this is more representative of what comes out. The, the, the buoyancy because of the warm breath coming out is what's carrying the plume upward. So the mask really um, cuts the uh, momentum of the jet, but our measurements are showing that just the single layer is not absorbing any of the aerosols, or not a lot of the aerosols, in this case, with this specific cover. We're working on exploring other mask materials that will do a better job of actually absorbing the aerosols. Okay, great.
All right, uh, so we're gonna look now at our um, CFD data results from our University of Maryland lab. And in here, um, and Jelena, whenever you're ready from, to jump in, if you want to, let me know. Otherwise, I'll toss a couple questions over your direction as well. Um, what we're gonna do here, this is a computerized uh, fluid dynamic model using the Wells-Riley equation. Uh, what we did is we're gonna show you a couple different models. One's gonna be an unmasked, mo unmasked model, and the other one's gonna be a masked model with a perfectly fit surgical mask at 64% efficiency. That's really important to know. And I know all of you, there's a lot of you saying, talk more about masks, I have questions about masks. We will dive deep into masks when we get to our recommendation section. Uh, so hang tight on that, that's coming. The other thing we did is we looked at our outdoor information and on our outdoor information, we looked at um, what we do with tents because last time we just had open air and now we had a lot of requests like what if we use a tent and how does it all work so we have some tent information here as well. So what we're looking at here is this is our outdoor case. This is the outdoor box a 20 meter by 60 meter by 20 meter uh, space and we're watching a 2.2 mile per hour elevation at 10 meters. It's about 30, 35 feet in the air. And you'll see the airflow comes in in the green arrow and goes out in the blue arrow. So that is our air direction. And then we get to the indoor case, you'll see here, we have air coming into the top, air coming out of the top, and we're in a half meter by half meter area. And then um, for, or I'm sorry, our indoor case here is our uh, four and a half by four by three and a half meter kind of box that our, our model person is in. Um, and this is an example of what a tightly fit mask looks like. You'll notice that it does follow all the contours of the face uh, to remain tightly fit. So what we have here is our uh, our impact of tents mask on infection. So over on um, this on the left side, this is our without mask data, which this should look very familiar. This is the data we kind of presented a couple of weeks ago. And on the right, you're going to see a perfect fit medical grade mask uh, in a canopy tent and what that looks like. What you see here is this is the front of the face. So over here is the nose and that nose is in the same spot for all six of our models. And then the wind is in their face going at a at face level, average face level at a half a mile an hour wind direction. So it's a pretty calm day outside. Um, Dr. Schubring, would you like to walk through some of this? I would just mention that uh, when we uh, did this simulation, it's very important to understand and think that it's possible to have much higher winds and also the winds that are uh, dramatically shifting directions. So this is kind of an average overlook of what's happening. So when James and Mark provide the major recommendations, this is the case study that we managed to conduct right now. And um, what we also are seeing here is that the tent does have influence on, um, on um, presence of, uh, uh, sorry, on dispersion of uh, uh, particles because it does slow down the wind compared to no tent condition. But what you're looking is the risk. So uh, we did not, uh, uh, pepper you with additional data on concentration and velocities. All of that is available and we will put in uh, animations, but again, at the pace that we are working, we are trying to bring the highest value information for your decision making. So happy to answer any additional questions. Great, and thank then, you, uh, oh, thank you. And to Dr. Schubring's point, uh, we are pushing our labs really hard and fast and we appreciate their willingness to work at the breakneck speed that we're going for. Uh, we all know that there is a deadline that we can't control with school starting. And so we've been trying to get this information as quickly as humanly possible. And so that's why we're seeing further study language being used quite a bit. Uh, someone did ask, can we have a tent with sides? The answer is no. Um, and that's just a hard no on that one. So what we're doing here is we're talking about open side tents with a high roof, uh, making sure that there's as much open airflow as, as possible. So then the indoor and I don't know if we mentioned, I'm sorry, before you go uh, to the next one, if you go to the previous slide, this tent structure, even under light breeze uh, with the open sides, if you uh, uh, actually gives you roughly the airflow rates and the protection that you would have with the flow, uh, with air flowing through really uh, critical spaces like uh, hospital rooms. So as long as there is a breeze, so it's not completely stale air, 
um, outdoor environment and outdoor canopies, not uh, tents, are actually uh, spaces where your students um, uh, with the social distancing and masks could engage in uh, learning activities. Good to know. And one thing we're talking about too with the tenting is that if you're going to be doing activity outside, uh, outdoors is, is best. And uh, this should only be used to protect you from some sort of element, adverse elements that are occurring. So if it starts to rain or it's 100 degrees outside, you need protection from the sun for a while. Uh, that's really what we're talking about with tenting. We're not talking about creating a kind of permanent space under a tent outdoors while doing performing arts activities. Would that be fair to say, Dr. Schrink? I would just add that actually, if you were to say have tenting with the side panels, that's actually worse than being inside a space that have a running air conditioning. All right, thank you. Uh, so the next thing we have is our indoor case study here. Uh, so we have a mask impact on infection risks. Uh, you'll notice that this one up here is our Singer model with um, without a mask and how that goes through. Uh, you'll see here that we have a perfect fit medical grade mask um, and this is the difference in that well fit. Now one thing that people are going to ask right away is well does this mean we can go to a 60 minute rehearsal right away? Uh, the answer to that is no and the, the main reason why we're sticking with the 30 minutes is this is with a perfect fit medical grade mask simulation. Um, we have our issue right now is we're not ready for the conversation of what creates a poor fit, good fit, perfect fit. Uh, we in our country are still uh, grappling with should we wear masks or not wear masks. And so until we get some more uniformity on the mask wearing and the best practices of mask wearing, uh, we still have to recommend that 30 minute time restriction. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit more on what the masks mean here in just a moment. Um, but that's why we're still sticking with the 30 minutes. Now, if everyone in the world wore masks at a medical grade with a perfect fit, we may be having a different recommendation, but right now we're not there. And so we're still sticking with a 30 minute recommendation for rehearsal periods. So with the mask fitting importance, so here's what makes a poor fitting mask. You have a gap in the sides, your nose is not covered, it's loose around the edges of the mask. All of these individually are poor mask fit to begin with. And so if you're having your mask under your nose, you may, the mask efficacy is drops dramatically and it's a poor fit. Um, if there's any gaps along the sides, it's considered a poor fit because all of that is just going out. Um, so the next thing we wanna do is look at what a better fitting mask is. This is one that fits along the side of your face in a contour fashion, it has no gaps on the sides, sides, your nose is covered and it has a fairly good fit around all of the edges. That would be a better fitting mask. A well-fitting mask has no gaps, has the nose covered, is tight around the edges, and it should leave a mask outline once removed because it's been fitted to your face. And this is what we're talking about in the computer modeling is what the perfect fit mask is. Um, so unless everyone in your choir has that well-fit mask, that's the difference there. So we wanna be very careful with how we are doing our mask ruminations. Now, any mask is better than no mask. Um, however, we wanna make sure that as we start looking at rehearsal times and whatnot, we're really looking at what the differences in these are. And so right now we have, we're pretty confident that we can get a lot of people to be wearing a better fitting mask, um, which would still remain in that 30 minute rehearsal recommendation. Dr. Shrebring, did I miss anything in that? That's all great, thank you, James. Okay. Okay, uh, so a couple other things we want to look at here just as reminders is the outdoor space covered by the canopy tent with fully open sides. The, we looked at those infection rates and they are significantly reduced using a well-fitted surgical style mask. Uh, like Dr. Shrewbrink mentioned, a tent with side panels would behave like an indoor space and has no benefit to risk reduction uh, by outdoor airflow. Even though you're outdoors, you technically take that advantage away by creating a wall and making it pseudo indoors. Um, a well-ventilated environment at the height of the mouth with an uh, infection risk of 10% is limited around the person uh, for around the three feet to 60 minutes with that perfectly fitted mask again. Um, the, CD, the CFD findings confirm that a surgical mask with 64% particle removal can have, uh, can have, of efficiency, can effectively reduce the spread of viral, viral, viral aerosols. That's harder to say than you would think. 
Um, and so now the next thing we're doing is taking these modelings and applying our experiment, actual experimental data and our next steps of things to make sure that everything is confirmed in the modeling uh, with uh, real life exper experimental data. And so that is our next phase of the study. So as we get into general considerations, a few things to remember. So performing arts activities have been found to create aerosol that is less than coughing, but more than talking. Uh, that's an important aspect to do. And we're talking talking at a low conversational volume, not talking in a projecting volume. Uh, the following considerations are effective for music, speech, theater, and debate activities. And this is for all forms of music and, uh, and, and the like. So when we talk music, we're not talking just band, we're talking band and choir. Uh, and then our orchestra folks who are out there, masking is still important. Uh, you just don't need to mask your instrument because you're not putting any air through it. So just mask your players and yourself. Mark? Okay, so the, uh, the median particle size range for singing is, uh, let me move some things around here, 1.3 microns, uh, which is obviously very tiny, but just for, uh, for comparison, the, the Shelley Miller video that we didn't quite clearly see, the coronavirus is about 0.1 micron. So the uh, median particle range for singing 1.3, clarinet 0.9. Uh, that's just the median size. So we're getting a lot of different size particles, but uh, a lot of small particles coming uh, out. So uh, most of the instruments, most of the wind instruments have the most particle emissions near the bells uh, coming out the ends of the instruments. And that, that is why we are strongly recommending that bell covers should be used on all instrument bells. Uh, so particle emissions uh, coming from the instruments are com comparable between all wind, wind instruments. Uh, the oboe is definitely an outlier right now, but we're, we need to do more testing on that, as well as singing and acting about, about the same as wind instruments, more or less. For the theater performer, uh, projecting the voice, uh, and this includes maybe teachers in front of a classroom. If you're projecting your voice, you're producing many more particles than just regular speaking. Uh, so, so when the theater person was projecting as if they were on stage in front of an audience, the amount of aerosol looked like uh, singing or playing an instrument. Okay. Next slide, James. There we go. All right. So what are the takeaways so far? Uh, first of all, masks are really, really super important. Uh, students should be masked at all times indoors, uh, um, and the instruments should be masked as well. The materials matter, so stretchable materials that will reduce the amount of captured aerosol, and single layers are not going to do uh, as well as yeah. double layering. We don't have specific recommendations at this time for materials on the bell covers, but materials such as masks are made of are going to work very well as well. Uh, we are still keeping with the six foot CDC guidance, um, both indoors and outdoors, and increasing that distance for uh, the trombone, uh, moving to seventh position, and the time, as indicated earlier, we're still keeping with a 30 minute rehearsal time. And then for an indoor rehearsal, we want to clear the room after 30 minutes of rehearsing to allow for at least one air change before the next rehearsal period begins. So the HVAC system in your room You'll need to have that available. And if you've done any remediation with HEPA filters and additional air purifiers, you should be able to calculate how many air changes, uh, at least one air change, but more obviously is better. Airflow, as said earlier, outdoors is the best place to be. And if you're going to be indoors, you need uh, uh, to try and use filtration such as HEPA, MERV 13, and then the air change rate per hour, that's the ACH. Uh, this, the industry standard is three. The more air changes per hour you can get in your room, the better. And then hygiene, we, uh, you know, the days of emptying spit valves onto the floor or anywhere you want to are over. We are recommending uh, puppy pads, which you'll see in just a moment, 
uh, disposable kind of towelettes, absorbent towelettes that each individual player can manage for themselves and dispose of uh, properly after the rehearsal. Still really important to wash your hands and sanitize them. And then uh, common areas, storage areas, uh, we need to make sure that we're keeping our social distancing and wearing masks. And I should point out here that really uh, everyone involved in performing arts activities should really have two masks, one that, one that they wear uh, just in general and one that they are using for their performance or, or playing or singing. Uh, so especially for the instrumentalists, uh, when we're talking about putting a slit in the mask, that is not the mask that you want to wear just out in the hallways and out and about. Uh, that is just for when you're indoors playing. Uh, so, so you have one mask for playing and one mask for just general use. Okay. So let's talk about masking. And um, so a couple of things. This is the CDC guidance. Uh, wash hands before putting on a mask. Place it over your nose, mouth, secured on your chin. Um, make sure it is secure chin to nose. Uh, try to fit it snugly against the sides of your face. Make sure you can breathe. Uh, don't make it so you suffocate. That's bad. Uh, wear a mask correctly for maximum protection. And then woodwinds and brass uh, should use a mask while playing, which includes a small straight slit in the surgical style mask. Um, do not, like Mark just mentioned, do not use your woodwind brass mask outside of rehearsal. Uh, that slit would be bad just walking around the hallway. So an example of what this looks like, this is a just one of those blue surgical masks you can buy at Walmart or Target or any of your favorite retailers. Uh, and then this is one of our researchers, Taya Stockman, and she just took a box cutter and cut a slit right there in the fold of the mask. And then you can see here, we're able to input uh, our, or the, um, the mouthpiece for performance. Uh, again, this is only for woodwinds and brass, singers, actors, string players, uh, dancers, anyone else who'll be masking up while doing performance. Do not do this. This is just for woodwind and brass players. All right, so a couple things we're going to look at here. We mask the person, we mask the instrument. So when we talk about a person with well-fitting, we want to do multi-layers. That's important. Um, we also want to um, have a surgical style mask because one, they're readily available. We already know the efficacy rates of them. Um, and they're also disposable when need to be. If you're going to have a more permanent mask, they need to be washable and dispose or disposable. If you have a washful mask, you need to make sure it can be washed and dried. And then if it dries, you can't it can't shrink, right? So that's a that's an important part too. Some of those cheaper masks on the market, uh, you'll wash them up, and then you'll notice like everything's kind of uh, crunched up on the sides and all that. That takes some of the efficacy out of it and makes it so it's not as fitting as well as it was. So make sure that you're really watching for that. On instruments, we're looking at a couple more things. So for bell covers. I know last time we said, you know, two, two layer, uh, 80 denier uh, fabric. We're still sticking with any bell cover is a good bell cover uh, because it does something. However, we're recommending that you put an additional filter component into the bell cover. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we are looking at is a MERV 13 type material. This is a filter material. Uh, you can buy it in rolls and sheets and cut it out to act as a filter inside of your bell cover. Uh, where this helps on the bell cover is it, um, your bell cover that you've already ordered. If you've already ordered them, don't go cancel your orders. Use the bell covers you've ordered or made or have done whatever you're doing with them. Uh, but then take this MERV 13 type material and put a uh, filter basically on the inside of that bell cover. Uh, Mark, you're doing something similar to this with your band, correct? Correct. And we have a, we have a double ply uh, bell cover and we will look at uh, adding additional filtration on the inside of that as well. So that's what we're really looking at doing. Uh, so don't cancel anything and don't be mad at us if you started on one route and did something and now we're telling you a little bit something different. Uh, we are being more restrictive as we get into this environment. We want to ensure that um, we are the most restrictive now and then we loosen up as the test results come in if we have that possibility. Uh, people are asking too, what do we do with French horn issues because you have to put the hand in the bell. Uh, there are uh, models that have been made out there for having a hand placement in the bell. Um, right now, we're still kind of working through that on the testing components on what kind of bell cover is the best way to go. Um, we don't have those results yet, so kind of hold tight. If you have an innovation in there, let us know. Um, more looking at that. The other thing you can do is use a surgical type max, a surgical mask type material. You can also buy in sheets, cut it out as a filter on the end of the bell cover. Uh, again, something is better than nothing. Uh, more layers is better than less layers. 
when we talked earlier about the stretchiness of things, uh, someone asked, I think in the uh, Q&A, they were like, oh, uh, how far did they stretch it? I don't really know that. All I know is that they stretched it far enough on the test where it didn't really do anything, as you can see from the APS data. So we're looking at a non-stretchy material. Again, if you already have ordered a stretchy material bell cover, don't cancel that, don't hate on us for that. Uh, grab the MERV 13 type material, cut it out as a filter component and let your bell cover hold that material on over the bell. So obviously when you cut those out, you're gonna cut it out bigger than the bell, put it on your bell cover, slide your bell cover on the instrument and then let that hold it on there. Um, I do wanna go back and talk about, there's lots of questions here on uh, masking fit. Let's see if I can find this slide here. So when we talk about the fit matters, um, you know, really having a, a nice solid fit is really important. Um, when we're talking about materials, you wanna find the material that has a rating already on the box of something that's a surgical grade rating. And if you look on there, there's all sorts of information. Uh, uh, Google is your friend when it comes to this, right? So we really wanna look for, um, you know, take a picture of the box, go to Google, see what the efficacy rating is, get one that's the highest rating that you can find. Um, as far as specialty masks that are starting to come out of the market, we have not tested those yet. Uh, we are still getting through all of our preliminary testing just to get all of our base rate samples. So we're able to say, you know, here is what we know and don't know. What we do know right now is that masking in a well-fit mask for singing and actors uh, does dramatically reduce the amount of aerosol uh, particles that are being expelled from the body. Uh, one of the tenets of the environmental engineering, and Dr. Schubring, please correct me if I'm wrong with what I'm about to say, is any issues we have, we want to keep those issues as close to the source as possible. And so what the idea with masking is, is that if we know we're expelling out a lot of aerosol, we want to stop that aerosol from being expelled out. Uh, the masking is what does that. And so we're trying to keep the issue that is being created as close to the source as possible. And since we are producing the aerosol, we are the source of the issue. The masking keeps that issue as close to you as possible. And you can see that in the CFD data that um, the University of Maryland has supplied for us because uh, all those red bands that were right next to the face, that's all the aerosol particulate matter being captured next to the face by the mask. So Dr. Schubring, did I describe that okay? Yes, absolutely great. It's uh, what is happening. Part of the particles is being captured, as James is saying, and the part is that you cannot really project the jet as deeply into the room and mix everything. So you, there is a double action there. And there is also another thing with the surgical masks. Uh, they also electrostatic capture the particles. So it's not all just filtration. Um, uh, uh, simply by capturing. So uh, there are other physical processes taking place there. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. And like I said, on the fit mask, as far as uh, singers and dancers and theatrical folks, we have not tested the specialty mask coming out yet. Uh, but the big things to remember is type of material matters. So the, uh, the higher the efficacy rating, the better. And the fit really matters. And so some of these specialty masks that are coming out, they have you like take real measurements of your face so they can measure it to fit the individual person. That is going to be a better fitting mask than grabbing the one um, at your favorite retailer and just taking it out of the package and throwing it on. Um, so even though we have not gotten to those testing regimes yet, um, you know, kind of take that that information with what it's for what it's worth there. Uh, also on masking, uh, masks should be worn by all students and staff prior to entering the performing arts rooms. Um, they should be worn at all times. And so when we start thinking about activities such as dance, uh, such as some of the theatrical components that'll exist where there's movement uh, going on, because I know in choir and in band, if we're just in the concert settings and in an orchestra, it's easy not to have kids move around the room, right? Sit down, don't go anywhere, class is over, now you can go somewhere. But in theater and in dance, that's really difficult because movement is just part of the activity. So what you wanna do is make sure you have a, a comfortable fitting mask, that can work for the movement. Uh, if you need to build in additional breaks, uh, we, I would recommend that the masks are um, worn at all time, even during the activity. Uh, there has not been a lot of evidence about um, your reduced oxygen levels with moving around with masks on, um, but make sure that they're comfortable. So if you need to build in some more breaks, build in some more breaks for those students, um, but masks are still important. The thing to watch out for uh, when you're talking about uh, those kinds of activities is anything that inverts a student. So if you're talking about a dance with an inversion component to it, make sure that we're not getting 
that we're securing the masks in a way that they do not slide off your face and impede vision because uh, that creates another safety issue. So just things to kind of think through as you're thinking about masks in this regard. Uh, teachers should consider using a portable amplifier. You are the one considered to be speaking the most in a room. Two benefits to this amplifier, as we mentioned last time, is you can put the microphone under your mask, secure your mask, and then it takes out the muffled sound from this. It also keeps your talking at a conversational low level, which is what we want to have happen. We know from both this study and previous studies that the louder you speak, the more aerosols you're going to generate, and the farther they're going to go out. Um, so we want to make sure that when you're masked, you're speaking at a low conversational volume. Um, and then also students should not ask any questions uh, without a mask, and they should also be saying them in a low conversational volume. I have uh, children of my own in middle school and elementary school, and there's lots of times I cannot understand them with a mask on. I get it. Uh, we want to make sure we're training our students in our classrooms to enunciate so they can still speak softly, but we can understand them through the mask. Um, don't have them be like, I couldn't hear you, and then have them yelling underneath the mask because now you're starting to get into some other issues as far as that goes. Uh, and I'll reiterate one more time, no talking without a mask being properly worn in your room. All right, uh, distance. Mark, you want me to get this one or you want me to go for it? Uh, it's up to you. Go for it. Okay, so uh, six feet, that, that has been the recommendation of the CDC since day one of this uh, uh, crisis. And um, it, it, it's, a, it's a number that is based on science of large droplets. Uh, and we just wanna be sure in this uh, environment that we're being as safe as we possibly can. The last thing we want to have happen is to have uh, our students get infected while they're with us. Um, so keep that six foot distancing, uh, six by six for each person, six, nine by six for trombone. And then we're gonna keep the same recommendations for outdoors, six by six. Uh, masks are strongly recommended and instrument bell covers should still be used outdoors as well. Next slide. Okay, so uh, again, we'll get into the time. So 30 minute indoor rehearsal time, and then take a break, leave the room, allow a minimum of one air change prior to the next use of the room, three would be better. If you have uh, a situation where you have a high change uh, rate in your room, uh, you, you can do the math on that and, and reduce the amount of time that you have to uh, be out of the room. Outdoors, Playing should cease for approximately five minutes to allow aerosols to disperse after 30 minutes of playing, okay? Uh, more study is needed prior to any more recommendations about time. And again, we're being very conservative at this point in time and with the hope that later on down the road as we have more data that we can loosen these restrictions. So um, don't blame the messenger. We're trying to keep everybody safe here. I will say too on the time, uh, the air change rates, you have to figure out how many there are. So if we, ha if you have a standard area of three air change rates per hour, it's gonna take you 20 minutes to get one air change to occur in that room. So you really wanna know these times before you get back in the classroom so you understand how that works for your timing purposes. And then if you need to speed up that airflow rate. Um, HEPA filters increase that rate, HEPA air purifiers increase that rate, seeing if your HVAC system would be cranked up to maximum can also increase that rate, but you need to understand that rate first. Three changes are better. And so I, I want to toss it back over to Dr. Shrebrink to talk about, somebody had a question on what if you have no HVAC in your room? So I was actually even thinking to address this on air. And so thank you, uh, James. I, I think bringing people in such room would be a really bad idea. Um, sometimes those rooms do have open uh, opportunity to open windows. Uh, so that would be maybe an, a consideration under which you should uh, uh, use that room. But um, um, in general, it's a bad idea to bring people without ventilation. Again, as James keep on mentioning several times, you could, uh, another alternative for a room like that, you could bring those portable um, 
air cleaners, HEPA air cleaners, and you also have to carefully check uh, um, uh, yourself or uh, with the, with the, your facility management, uh, whether you have an adequate flow rate through such a HEPA filter. And uh, when it comes to filtration, another thing that we find in the field, people uh, tend to buy the device and run it and then never change the filter. That's also, um, a really bad idea. So each of these devices uh, that you might bring in to improve the quality of the air uh, under these circumstances, you should really be careful about changing filters, um, opening the windows whenever possible, and in general increasing the flow rate in the room of a fresh clean air uh, with every little bit helps. Um, not ventilated uh, room um, and without open windows and without one or multiple uh, HEPA filtration devices, um, I would uh, not advise to spend any time there unless a single person um, doing something. And we have a lot of people asking too, um, what happens if we have a classroom schedule where we're not allowed to have the room empty for at least one air change through there. So we, we, I'm not sure we're ready to fully answer that question yet. Uh, we still have some more study to do, unless Dr. Shrubrink is ready to answer that question, but she's the expert, so I'm not going to try to answer it. My immediate thing would be that we just need to limit the amount of uh, aerosol activities we know produces a bunch of aerosol to try to allow, allow the room HVAC systems to keep up or add more filtration to it. Um, you know, the more HEPA filters you have in there, and the HEPA filters are designed for the size of those rooms, and on the sides of the boxes of the HEPA filters you can buy, uh, they will have, um, uh, they will have like how big of a square footage of room they can, they can handle, and how many air change rates you can have based on the size of the room. Here's an example, I'm going to try to make sure I don't show you the brand of this box. Uh, and you can't see it anyway, so never mind. But on this box here, uh, it has a 10 by 10 foot room, gives me an additional 10.8 air change rates per hour. If it's a 12 by 12 room, it's 7.5, and it's a 14 by 14 room, it's five and a half air change rates. And so it'll say that on almost every box in the HEPA filter that you're able to buy on the market. So use those guidelines uh, as far as how many air change rates you're able to spill over. But I would just add to James's comments. Again, we don't want to advertise any brand. Uh, I, uh, they are all the same as long as they have the same filter. Um, and uh, they issue maybe better guidelines to you how to evaluate their effectiveness yourself. But if I was you, uh, and I am, <laughs> because I also teach classes, uh, except that I teach HVC classes, but anyway, uh, I would not improvise. I would actually always seek additional advice because it's a human life at stake um, and your safety and your student safety. So if you have facility management um, offices that are accessible, or if you have some specific questions for us, we can uh, try to entertain them. We are getting uh, enormous volume of questions. So be patient with us. We are trying to kind of group and in mass answer, but for your specific situations, and again, I answer a couple of specific situations. The idea is that you really um, need a little bit of assistance or second check from somebody uh, in your school who is uh, dealing with facilities uh, to help you evaluate whether what you bought, installed and running is sufficient. Again, mm -hmm. it is possible to buy time, but I would really defer to experts in your schools to uh, help you determine um, how much time and how to do so. Yeah, that's a great point. In our last uh, presentation, we really talked about having those conversations with your facilities management uh, as soon as possible. And so if you haven't had those conversations, uh, now's a great time to have those. Okay, and we talked about a lot of this already. Um, so I'm just gonna cover this real quick, Mark, if that's all right. Um, so remember open air is the best way to go. Air filtration, make sure your HEPA filter is done for the size of the room. Filtration certification is important too. Make sure you have a CADR, which is a clean air delivery rate. It should be on every HEPA filter you buy. If it's not on that box, don't buy that box. Uh, same thing with the AH, the AHAM certification, which is Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. They'll have their ratings on there as well. And on that rating, it'll tell you, let me see what this box says. 
tell you what the uh, the ratings is for smoke, dust, pollen, and other uh, environmental areas. And so, uh, again, the higher the rating on those, the better. Uh, air change rates per hour, for the modeling purposes we used here, we used a standard three air change rates per hour. So all those modelings you saw um, are with people with active models actively in that room with an average of three air change rates per hour. Uh, so you can still see that even though the air change is going, as we have activity in that room that is unmasked, we're seeing a uh, collection of aerosols accumulating in that room. Uh, also, the ASHRAE guidelines, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, has a lot of great resources on their website. And you'll see the website here coming up on the resources slide that we have available. Um, before we cover hygiene, I want to get a couple of questions answered here that we have going on in the Q&A in the chat. Um, one, this will be available, this recording will be available on YouTube when it's done. We'll have the um, slide deck put as a PDF on the website when it's completed as well. And all the links that we've talked about here and the resources will also be available. So I know some people are saying that they have got to get off because uh, they had an hour scheduled. And so we just want to make sure everyone knows that. Mark, do you want to go through some hygiene? Sure. So uh, again, we, we previously, previously spoke about this, but um, uh, spit valves, uh, let, let these be gently emptied. Uh, we don't want to get into old habits where we forcefully blow air through the instrument to get that um, cleared out. We want to let that drip out or, or just very gently uh, come out. And we want it going into uh, a, an absorbent disposable material. A puppy pad is a great sort of material. It doesn't have to be that, but something that the individual can take with them when you're finished and dispose of properly. Uh, hand washing, continue to be stressed, hand sanitizer, uh, and, and keeping, keeping your extremities very clean. These are the things where we tend to touch our nose and mouth. Uh, common areas should be uh, always socially distant and always masked, and uh, cleaning surfaces as previous recommendations, uh, continue to be doing this and um, the wipes should be discarded uh, properly. So we don't want any disinfecting wipes just sitting around the rooms here. Uh, they all needed to be disposed of properly. Um, here's a bunch of resources we have. So a couple of things that I'm seeing in the chat. One with the elementary students. So we, are, we have lab capacity that we're maxing out to the best of our ability. Uh, we still have a lot more testing to do in our preliminary runs. So all of these resources we have here, or all of the um, guidance we have is for everybody. It's for all music, whether you're in high school, college, elementary, um, with the recorders coming in next. And what we're gonna be doing here, instead of having another uh, webinar in a few weeks, as we get some of these, this data, we'll post updates to our FAQ page and the main coalition page. Uh, so watch for the recorded data as that comes up and we'll go ahead and put on our recorder recommendations for elementary students. Uh, but again, all elementary students, whether they're sitting or singing should also be uh, in masks and have that 30 minute uh, activity um, guidance. I uh, had a question on does the 30 minute guidance in rehearsal space also apply to a theater setting where they could be in a gigantic room uh, doing the thing. If our 30 minute recommendation uh, stays for outdoors, it also applies for indoor theater spaces regardless of size. So I would treat the indoor theater space kind of as an in-betweener for the um, the classroom or the band or the uh, rehearsal room and outdoors. So outdoors, we're talking about a 30 minute re, um, rehearsal with a five minute rest period. Uh, we would be doing a similar thing for the theater in the large space. Um, Dr. Shrubring, does that sound appropriate? Okay, perfect. Um, so that's kind of how that goes. All the questions that are being asked here, we are capturing all of these and we'll be recording them and we will uh, categorize them and answer them in the next few days and put answers on the FAQ page on the main coalition page. So when you see, um, I think most of us uh, on this call are able to access that main coalition page. Um, so watch for a couple of things. This presentation, a link to it. The presentation is a PowerPoint into a PDF format. Uh, watch the FAQ page because in a few days you're gonna see a gigantic post on that. That'll have answers to most of the questions that have been asked here today. Uh, Kyle has also sent you the link to the coalition page in case you did not have it before. And we'll make sure that's on the YouTube link as well. Um, and then, so you'll see all those resources start popping up. So I apologize to those of you who we did not get your questions answered today. We will go through and capture all of these and ask those questions or answer those questions, excuse me. We also have a submitted question function. So as you read through, which we recommend you read the FAQs first 
and then go to the submitted question function on the web page uh, if we have not answered it. Um, so you should be able to get everything there. One thing we want to do too, I forgot a, a point. So we also talked about how masks are strongly recommended outdoors at six foot or farther distance. Um, if it's 110 degrees outside, you guys need to make your decision there, but masks are still strongly recommended outdoors. Indoors, you got to have them on. That's not really a, a negotiable there. So a couple more tools we have that you see on the screen is University of Colorado Boulder developed the risk assessment tool. They are making updates to that uh, often, which is great for us. They've got good resources on there as far as what the risk level uh, estimator would be within your classroom in your particular situation. Uh, the next thing we have is a um, the Harvard UC Boulder portable air, portable air cleaner calculator for schools. This is a version 1.1. This is where you can go in and put in all of your information and kind of see what portable air, air cleaners you need for your area. We also have a link to the ASHRAE guidance on there, and this goes specifically to the COVID-19 guidance on their website. Our next round of information, uh, we don't have a set deadline for that yet. We're gonna let our scientists do their scientist things and crank through a lot of the data stuff that they need. So we're gonna be improving our chamber performances, developing specialized emission estimation capacities, uh, testing the recorder, as well as everything else that, has, uh, that needs more testing. One thing we're finding is that as we're testing through, we need to go through and retest and retest and retest again. So we'll have more of those things going through. And then we're also narrowing the type of instruments we'll be doing in the study and increasing the study on mitigation. That's the next flow. So all of our mitigation stuff we have today was pretty restrictive and we want to ensure that's restrictive to provide the maximum amount of risk uh, minimization we can supply for everybody. Um, as we progress through, you'll be seeing more guidelines on you know, material usage and those kinds of things that we have for mitigation strategies. Uh, as we know more, we'll let you know more, and um, the options for mitigation will expand over the course of time. However, we are playing it on the conservative side today, making sure that we tell you things that we know today that do work, uh, so you can try to um, get back into the classrooms in the least amount of risk as we can provide for people. Um, with that, I will leave, uh, I'll allow uh, Dr. Shrewbrink to give any final uh, comments you'd like to give, as well as uh, Dr. Speed. And then all questions, please put them in the Q&A area so we can capture those and answer them on our FAQ page. I would just mention that uh, maybe to the research page, you could uh, put where we had um, that those animations uh, uh, as a resource. Uh, sorry, something, something COVID-19 as well. I would uh, also uh, advise community that we will have there uh, some simulations for school buses and uh, classrooms as well posted next week. So there are materials from other projects because we are working with the uh, um, superintendents uh, here both in um, Maryland and Massachusetts uh, to address some of their questions. So some of that materials might be uh, useful there. And again, I will be happy to address very specific questions, especially in groups uh, through the chats that, uh, through the resources that James and Mark established. Um, so stay safe. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say that uh, the, uh, the main NFHS coalition website page has a lot of information and there's a few important links right at the top of that. There's a one pager that you can print off and use as a primer uh, sort of summarizes all the recommendations that we've been making onto one page. So it's a, a concise, easy to use and easy to distribute to your administrators um, kind of page. And the FAQ uh, page is linked there as well. So that's, that's really your one-stop shop for all the information on this study. Uh, you know, we are, we are getting ready to head back into school or already back for, for some. And, um, you know, we are all in the same boat together. Uh, we, we want to make sure that music and performing art activities survive this pandemic. And we are trying as hard as we can to provide everyone with the best information that we can. Uh, if, if you realize we were, we commissioned the two science teams back in May, which seems like a long time ago, but they have been inundated since that time by requests for additional studies because everybody is calling on these experts to, for, for answers right now and for more research and more study. Uh, and it's, it's really ramped up as we've gotten into the beginning of the school year. 
So we're very fortunate that we were able to get this started when we did uh, and, and to have some answers now. We understand this is not a, a complete study. Uh, we don't have every single recommendation that we possibly can make right now, um, but we're, we're giving you the best information as we get it and, and hopefully you can make use of it. And um, you know, I'll, I'll just end with my usual spiel that uh, we are doing nothing less here than trying to save the performing arts uh, during this pandemic. And it's really important for all of us to do our part uh, to make sure that, that we survive this time because we need performing arts in our lives. Humanity needs it. Uh, we, we can't do without it. And, and we just can't let it uh, go away. So we, it's on all of us every single one of us to use this information, to make good decisions, to advocate for our programs, and, and to keep music and performing arts alive. Uh, we, we have to do it. So good luck everyone. And um, I, I feel all your pain. My, my band program is getting ready to start up next week and we're doing it virtually to start. But uh, I know when I see my students in person uh, that I have some great mitigation strategies to keep them safe. So uh, thank, thanks for all, uh, all of you watching and especially thanks to James Weaver, uh, my partner in crime here, uh, co-chair of the coalition study. Uh, he's been a fantastic partner to work with. Thank you, Mark, and, uh, and thank you, Jelena, for being on here with us today. Uh, with that, we will conclude this webinar and the broadcast on YouTube. Like I said before, if you have uh, questions or concerns, put them in the Q&A, we'll capture them. If we miss the Q&A by the end of this, use our uh, submitted question feature on the website. Lots of information there. Uh, we are here to try to help as much as we can. Um, so please be patient with some of that. Remember, Mark and I get about 500 emails a day, so we try to reply as we can. If it takes a while, we apologize in advance. Uh, but thank you to everyone who is here today. Hopefully this was helpful. Uh, lots of resources coming out, and we are um, excited to see the next phases of the study get into high gear and get more information out, and then keep an eye on that page as it comes out. Thank you very much, everyone, and we hope you have a great day. Stay safe out there. Stay healthy.